Welcome to the underground, the Steel City Underground, the black and gold standard for Pittsburgh Steelers coverage. Now, here are your hosts, Joe Kuzma and Brian E. Roach. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Steel City Underground podcast, sounding all dramatic and uh, emotional. My name is Joe Kuzma. And I am joined today by Mr. 110% ready to go for this show or not, the uh, peanut butter to my jelly, one Mr. Brian E. Roach. What's up, Brian? Okay, that that I like, the peanut butter. I, I like being the peanut butter. I'd rather be the peanut butter than the jelly. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm excellent. And as you said, 110% ready to go. Now, is that like... If I would have said jam or would have said you were jelly or jam, I, I could just see you getting in an argument over that. I'm not going to go there, but I imagine jam never- is between your toes. <laughs> that is toe jam to be specific. Yes. But you ever toast? You ever had a toasted like bread on a peanut butter and jelly? You know the answer to that. I do. Now, I just, why would you sacrilegiously destroy I, an American classic sandwich <laughs> with toasting the bread and dist- oh, it's awful. <laughs> oh man, you know, I could just picture you walking into a sub shop and they ask you, "Would you like the bread toasted on this?" Like the final question. They're, they've already put on the lettuce and tomato and the veggies and the meats and the cheeses and maybe you know, but maybe the dressing cup. Well, actually, you know what? They would toast it before all that because you wouldn't do you wouldn't toast the veggies, but. I can just see you walking out. <laughs> like, you'd be Absolutely. so offended. I, I would say, what have you done to my sandwich? What are you going to do to my sandwich? You're like, this is this is a new feature at our establishment, and you'd be like, no. <laughs> this is a terrible idea. I, You know, the, the reason I bring this up is because we, we used to always say the host who loves toast, the host who doesn't love toast. It was our little inside joke for a while. It got old. We stopped doing it. We, we kind of came full circle. On the last episode, we were talking about, you know, I I just, for some reason, we brought it up that we own all sorts of stuff, Steelers stuff, like anything and everything, socks, underwear, you name it. And we were talking about the toaster. And actually, I don't own a toaster, a Steelers toaster either. I think it's kind of dumb. Tina said she used to have one, and it only toasts the Steelers logo. The rest of the bread stays like, I guess you would call it raw uh, in your case. But it got me and you thinking. We were like, you know what? That'd be a pretty good. Uh, that would be maybe an entertaining show. But we, we that's not today's topic. I, I kind of wanted to put it out for uh, the, a symposium here for our listeners to opine as to whether or not they would like to hear some of the like just junk that we do own and and some of the cool stuff we do because I have like close to twenty jerseys. I you have like a wall of memorabilia. You just put how many items on eBay? By the way, I'll let you plug your eBay. What's going on here, uh, Brian? A hundred and ninety-three items all, on eBay. That wasn't all Steelers stuff. Every single one of them is is a piece of Steelers memorabilia, and the reason is because two hundred mini helmets is a lot more manageable than four hundred mini helmets. My good, and I told you you didn't need the Neil O'Donnell mini helmet or the Roosevelt Knicks. I one. don't own an, anything, anything of he who shall not be named. <laughs> I own none of that. And, and speaking of which, you put out a very nice article. On the survival series about man caves, and yet you did not mention my man cave, so I am insulted and offended. Well, I thought it was an office and not a man cave. Maybe it, maybe it's dual purpose. It's the practical reason. I could have put that in there. I didn't even think of it. It's practical. That's right. Yeah, for those who aren't aware, sometimes we do some like just general info uh, articles because there's like nothing else to talk about over on the website, and I talked about... Uh, so just some base uh, ideas for a man cave because what I'd really love to do, and I'd love to do a show on that too if someone has interest. But uh, I'd love to have like three TVs in the. I kind of have a home theater room. It's not quite a man cave because the woman uh, happens to be a Browns fan. So I think I've mentioned this before. I do have a bar in my basement, and if we happen to have like I have a Steelers gnome, we have to have a Browns gnome. If I have the uh, Rydell, like the old style throwback metal sign, 
I have a Steelers one with Steely McBeam. Oh, yeah, we have to have the little, like, leprechaun thing or whatever it is that, that, that the Browns use for a mascot. One of their 80 bajillion mascots that they have. Uh, we have to have that sign, too. We have to have, like, a one-for-one one almost. So we don't have uh, – because she doesn't want to see a lot of Steelers stuff, and I don't want to see a lot of Brown stuff, and we have to have an equal – we have to have equity here – I, 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 uh, I, I, we don't have a whole lot of stuff, so it's not technically the man cave I would like. It's more like a home theater type area with my big screen TV and the surround sound and stuff. But I would like to have like some satellite TVs, smaller ones off to the side because you know, uh, right now, I mean, it's it's kind of like um, you're, you're towards the end of basketball season. You know, the NBA Finals are on, the Stanley Cup's on. And they don't overlap, but for a period of time there, I'm watching the Penguins and the Cavs. They're both on at the same time, so I have like an iPad going and a TV going. And then during the NFL season, it would be great to watch multiple games on Sunday at the same time. I, I mean, not while the Steelers are really on, but you could do Red Zone Channel. But I thought it would be kind of cool to have like Fox, the Fox game on and the CBS game on and then maybe Red Zone or the NFL Network's feed going at the same time. And I digress. I'm going off into into, into different areas as we have habit of doing and getting yelled at for. Someone's going to slap my hand over here. But I do, I do have to say this. Just the image of a half Steelers, half Browns room – is disturbing to me because you how can you have that beautiful lovely black and gold on one side and then that baby diarrhea orange on the other side well orange is that's my, just no good orange is my favorite color but combined with the diarrhea brown i think is what you meant to say can't yes, do that well you know it's you can't we have, have it it's white walls white walls and paneling man i mean it's you know it's literally what we have and then we have one of those things that says like house divided and it has both logos with like you know like a a tear in the middle uh that's kind of neat somebody gave us that as a gift and i know you have something similar i have something that's just kind of generic where it says there's four seasons it's um it's winter spring summer and football uh that's one of my favorite signs i have up so folks you know I, we could talk about uh, trust me me and brian could talk about this for an hour and we could also talk about all the things we own if you want to hear about man caves or tips on uh, maybe some uh, getting tickets for a game or what to do tailgating let us know drop us a line because i mean we we need things to talk about during the season and uh are the off season and well, a, a lot of people just want to hear X's and O's with football and who's doing what and and all the dirt and drama and everything else. We're Steelers Nation, baby. We got to party before games, whether we're home gating, tailgating, whatever it be. And I'd be more than happy to share some of my experience. I know Brian would as well. So, obviously, yes, I'm, I'll happily do a video podcast touring my lovely history oh. uh history of the Steelers uh, office if anybody wanted to see it <laughs> see you know the, the reason I haven't been on video just so somebody uh, I've been trying to play with this I don't have the right lighting where I record is kind of an unkempt area uh it, you know my house in general is a wreck because I have a four-year-old that just destroys and clutters everything uh, so I, I have been reluctant to um to be on video but I will be on video maybe me, you and I get together maybe maybe training camp or something, we could do a live yeah. video or Facebook Live or one of those things the kids are doing. So today, today, now that we are, hmm, how far in? Eight minutes into the show. Uh, <laughs> we've talked about toasters and Steelers stuff and jerseys and, and man caves. Let's talk about something. We have football stuff, sort of, sort of, kind of. It's football related. Yeah, yes, it's it football is. stuff. It is football stuff. I, I, want, I was thinking about this. I, I was digging into some stuff. I was just kind of curious. It, it, this all came about because I was looking to see, like, I was like, Mike, Mike Tomlin had, like, a contract. Blah, blah, blah. Had to do with some of the coaching changes on, on just not only the Steelers staff, but, you know, the, the Bengals have, like, a new offensive line coach. They have, uh, I think, was it Bill Lazers, a new OC. Todd Haley's a new OC in, in um, Cleveland. Uh I think there's a new OC. There's definitely a, a new coach over in uh, Baltimore, too. I think – do all four teams have a new offensive coordinator? I think that might be the case, too, as well as what we were saying, drafting quarterbacks. But there's a link with the head coaches here, too. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to look this up, Brian. It's bothering me because you know what? I was reading this. But anyway, let's just start with I, – I was wondering who would be on the hot seat because as I look around, you get the Steelers and then there's everybody else. Uh, the right. Ravens haven't been extremely hot as of late. The Bengals have been in a slump for two seasons. And if you even, uh, I don't even know that you could call a slump what the Browns were. They'd be happy to be where the Bengals were over the last two years. <laughs> um, Mike Tomlin, let's just start with the man. Uh, you ever picture a scenario where he's on the hot seat? 
I'll be honest. I, I, there's, it's feasible in, in the right circumstances, but it's unlikely. You know, this is this is a guy, despite uh, what much of the nation would like to say, who is by statistics and by record probably the second best coach in the NFL. Um, so it's not like you're going to upgrade really well. Tomlin doesn't lose the team. Tomlin hasn't had a losing record. Uh, you know, we can go on and on about these things. And yes, just as with any coach, there are going to be things that we a- are aggravated about. I still can't get past the onside kick. It bothers me <laughs> even now. Yeah. It will continue you. to bother me for the rest of my life. But that doesn't mean I'm going to turn on the coach because of one decision that I question. Um, and that's not what the Steelers do either. I mean, they're known for their their level of consistency and patient with coaches, patience with coaches. In my mind, Mike Tomlin leaves when Mike Tomlin wants to leave. Um, because when he's ready to say, I'm done, I've done this enough, I'm going to step down, uh, and I'm going to go do the announcing thing, or I'm going to go be on TV, or I'm just going to go and, and, and be cool in the, you know, in the, in the, in the Wherever neighborhood, he's cool. man cave. wherever he's going to be cave. cool, yeah, his man cave, uh, that's what he'll leave. But, you know, to answer the question after a long winded response, if, If the Steelers went through a real downturn with the group that they have uh, and and, and had what I would consider really underperforming seasons where they lost, they had losing seasons, you know, uh, or really embarrassing, consistently really embarrassing exits from the playoffs. Yeah, last year was not good, but not not consistent. <laughs> you know, if that happened consistently every year, then, you know, then there might be a little pressure. I mean, they tend to extend Toblin two years every time they extend him. Um, and I think that, that that's going to continue up until the point that Mike Tomlin says, ah, I've had enough. I'm ready to go. I, I don't disagree with anything you said. And I, I somewhat kid, but this is like the fire Tomlin crowd that's out there on the flip side of the equation. When you talk about embarrassing exits from the playoffs, and this is going to come up again when we talk about, because we're going to talk about all of the AFC North here, that loss to the Ravens. But, you know, they didn't have Le'Veon Bell. They had Ben Tate back there, and he was responsible for quite a bit of that loss, as was just a bad defense. But that was 2014, uh, the wild card uh, exit that they had. Uh, A lot of people would say they got embarrassed in the AFC Championship game with the Patriots. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how to take that either. Also losing Bell in that game. Uh, You know what? Now that I say that twice, you you, got to wonder – if if we don't have Le'Veon Bell and we had that whole spiel about that, oh, well, anyways, uh, I digress. <laughs> I think they're <laughs> I think they're better prepared. I think they're better prepared than having Ben Tate and then of course, uh, what Jordan uh, Jordan Todd. Well, they did. I think they did have D D Will. Well, D Will came in when uh, the AFC Championship game. That's right. Yeah. Um, but th- and then they had Jordan Toddman and uh, Fitzgerald Toussaint for that one playoff span too. But in saying that. Tomlin, he's gone three and five since they lost the Super Bowl against the Packers. That would be three and six with that Packers Super Bowl loss. Three and five since then, including the Tebow thing. Uh, God, another one. They're never going to sit well with you because you could taste victory, especially that year when they lost to Tebow and the Broncos in, in the first new overtime rule game. And that just was garbage. I hate it. I hate seeing the replay of that. Anytime it's on, I want to punch a TV, uh, kick a puppy, and I don't know, other things that aren't kick nice. Kick a puppy? Yeah, it's pretty bad, oh. man. It's pretty bad. Tebow has driven me that far, man. That far. I'm on the <laughs> edge. Don't push me. Uh, All right. Yeah. Um, so, three and five. But you know what? Teams would kill to be in eight of those eight playoff games over that same period of time. Eight playoff games. And also four straight years where they've been in the postseason. Would have been five if not for 
within his very own man cave, Tomlin says, I'll leave that between, uh, what was it, my wife, my kids, and the walls of my home when, uh, what was that, the the San Diego Chargers and the Kansas City Chiefs, and uh, the Chiefs played all their backups in the final week of the season, and the Steelers were had that 8-8 eight and eight season and could have squeaked in the playoffs yep. and, and didn't because uh, the referees blew like a call and there should have been a penalty and the guy missed the field goal and the, and the whole nine yards. Uh, bringing it full circle there, four straight postseason appearances, three of the four uh, last four seasons uh, winning the division. He he hasn't cooled off, and he ha- he's like, what, one of like four or five coaches to win 100 games in their first 10 seasons. And when you look at guys like Joe Gibbs and John Madden and Don Shula and the names that are, that are alongside the numbers – and you realize what what he's worked with at times, you know. Uh, it's quite amazing to see what Tomlin has done. I don't envision any scenario where he could be going anywhere. His seat could get a little hot. It, they would have to have a losing year. They'd have, and they'd have to have a losing year with the team as it is right now. I'm talking about yes. Killer B's healthy. Um, it, it, this would have to be like a scenario where, okay, they brought in Terrell Edmonds, and he just is a bust. And John Bostic is a bust, and they never and they don't have anybody that could fulfill Ryan Shazier's thing. Kind of like having Sean Spence out there uh, at the tail end of last season, and they just completely implode. And before I kick it over to you, by the way, not a new offensive coordinator. Marty Morningweg's been there since 2016 for the Baltimore Ravens. Is a new defensive coordinator. The linebackers coach got promoted. Don Martindale. Gotcha. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I think that uh, Tomlin is safe. Uh, but yeah, it, I mean, when we are talking about the scenario where he could go, that's exactly right. The, it'd have to be with the stars available and, and essentially the team just falling on its face. And while there are some <clears throat> out there who I, I won't net mention, and I don't even know if they listen, but there are some <laughs> out there in, in the Twitter universe who claim that they have been falling on their face for the last uh, you know 10 years. They haven't. Um, you know, it's, no. it, you can't win every year. It's not Madden. You can't do what I've done and won the Super Bowl on Madden for 14 or 17 or 20 years in a row. That just doesn't happen. Plus the NFL would shut down. Well, so it's the same thing with the, well, it's the Patriots take the Patriots losing. A, do you think that's a disappointment? I mean, it is to their fans that they lost to the Super Bowl, uh, lost in the Super Bowl to the Eagles. Or they lose an AFC championship game to the Broncos, you know, they get they get that far. But overall, that that's tremendously successful. They're definitely the benchmark. The Steelers aren't very far behind them, and they play in the same conference. This isn't like the NBA where the Cavs, it's just LeBron, and the whole Eastern Conference sucks, and, you know, I'm a Cavs guy, but – they just they kind of walk in there and then they get stomped by the Golden State Warriors. You even got to look at it from that perspective. It's quite amazing. LeBron gets in there that many times. I don't want to get in a LeBron MJ debate, but I just want to kind of equate that to other sports. You look around, how many other teams have the success of winning that many divisions, being in the playoffs that many times in a row? Uh, around the NFL, there was what, like is six or eight new playoff teams of, of how many that actually get in there? Uh, six in each division, 12 overall, uh, just this past year. I mean, the uh, some of the teams f- fall off the rails or don't get there and blah, blah, blah. Dallas Cowboys fans would kill for the success that the Steelers have right now. They're truly still living in the past where they had Jimmy Johnson as the coach and everything like that. Yeah. And, and Jason Garrett, what has he ever done in the postseason? You know what I mean? And, and yeah. so he still has a job. So Tomlin, definitely safe. I don't want to harp on Tomlin too much longer, but just the careful choice of words with disappointment because only one team doesn't ever lose in the postseason every year, and they end up hoisting the Lombardi Trophy. So there's always going to be playoff disappointment and losses. However, when we talk about losses, oh, you got to talk about the Cleveland Browns. I mean, this is this is cap this is the captain obvious um, area right here. Now, when you have a head coaching record and your percentage is a point one eight eight percent in your career. And uh, you've won, you've gone nine and thirty nine as a head coach, and you've only had one victory in two years of your current stint. One and thirty one, Hugh Jackson. I don't know how the guy wasn't on the hot seat. I, I would have thought immediately when Sashi Brown was canned from there, and they brought John Dorsey in, and we've seen the moves, and we've actually given a little bit of praise here or there, and and said you know watch out, Cleveland might be might be turning this around. 
They, they didn't get rid of Hugh Jackson. It's just the guy had three quarterbacks last year, of which how many of those guys did he bring on board? He drafted Deshaun Kaiser. I believe he drafted Cody Kessler as well. And uh, I'm trying to think even who the other guy was, Chris Hogan or something like that. This guy's supposed to be a quarterback whisperer, and none of those guys are even on their roster right now. Uh, they're like in constant makeover mode. Now, Dorsey might have gotten them in better shape for this year, but how much patience do you think a team that's finished dead last in the AFC North seven straight seasons? Uh, let me see here. I think they've only finished better than dead last twice since they've last made the playoffs, which is almost like 15 years, I think it was like 2003 or something. And the Steelers haven't had a losing season since the Browns have like, I think they made the playoffs somewhere else in the middle there, but you get my point. There's like two out of 15 seasons where they haven't been like in the basement, I believe is the statistic that I have. How much patience do you think the guy who names Tyrod Taylor as starter after taking Baker Mayfield, number one overall, how much patience is there to tolerate if Hugh Jackson doesn't play Mayfield and they end up, st- you know, uh, uh, crapping the bed again this season, I don't know that he could. He's under contract, and this is going to be the common link between all of these coaches except Mike, Mike Tomlin. They have two years left on their contract. They're all through 2019. I don't see him making it through 2018, Brian. Uh, it would be – look, I think if the Browns show improvement, if, if Tyrod Taylor is capable – um, and they don't come out of the gates 0 and 6, you know, then there's a shot he can make it through the season. But there's no reason to assume any of that will happen. <laughs> and if they come out and they, you know, uh, essentially, you know, to, to quote uh, Negan from Walking Dead, if they put their poopy <laughs> pants on and, and essentially because it's, you know, they're going to crap their pants then, yeah, I can't imagine. He has to be on the hot seat. He has to have been on the hot seat. I don't know exactly what uh, he did to get out of last season after, you know, essentially going backwards, winning one game and then losing them all. Um, You know, I I get the whole money ball, trust the process kind of concept thinking that they have or appear to have over there. Or they did have, yeah. Yeah, but it doesn't. It doesn't work unless you get results at some point. And is Hugh Jackson the truly the guy to get them those results? You, you have to start questioning it at some point. Um, it'll be interesting uh, to see how the how you know how they open against the Steelers. Uh, how long Tyrod Taylor remains the starter? If in fact, despite what Hugh said, he goes into the season as the starter. Um, you never know what could change during. Uh, you know, uh, camp and, and, and during the, uh, you know, preseason games. But, uh, you, you know, I, you know, I don't have tremendous faith in Baker Mayfield either. So it's not like I think Baker Mayfield's a stud. We've talked about that before. <laughs> um, I, you know, it'll be, it'll be, I, I wish I knew who was the one responsible for that choice, because if it's not Hugh, I think he's going to get the blame for it, but if it if it wasn't him and it succeeds, he won't get the praise. <laughs> so we'll yeah, see, we'll wait and see. I mean, it was amazing. He made it out of the first year after going one in fifteen. I mean, you're like, yeah, they can't possibly do be worse. And uh, you know, pr- even Pro Football Focus said, oh, they fixed their offensive line last year. And it, it, you're looking at some of the moves and the draft picks and things that they did, and you're like, okay, uh, this team can maybe win five games. I thought I had them better than the Baltimore Ravens, or uh, you know. I thought they could like overtake the Ravens. Maybe I thought the Ravens were yeah. really down, going to be down on their luck last season, especially with all the injuries that they had in the off season. I mean, it was just a mess. But uh, they didn't. He, Hugh Jackson did worse, and somehow he's still there. He has to have a very hot seat. Uh, I could see some continuity. I think it, I, it, there's a part of me that says because you know the Steelers have only had three coaches since 1969, and Tomlin enters what is 11th year or 12th year, 11th year now, I believe. Yep. And um, it's just like, hey, uh, I, I get it. You don't want to, like, 
overhaul these things all the time, but then they're still changing coordinators. I mean, Hugh Jackson hasn't had a, a true offensive coordinator. He was going to try and call the plays and stuff. Look how well that turned out. So now they got <laughs> Todd Haley who brings in this thing that's like, you know, this Einstein terminology. And I don't know that these guys are going to be able to grasp it all in one off season either. That could, it could be, it could be a disaster once again. Plus they got to try and find a guy to replace Joe Thomas and stuff like that. I, I just, I don't know how much patience could be there for a team. Now, Pop quiz, Brian. I think you you should know this question. When did Heinz Field open? You know, I should know that question. Oh, <laughs> come on, man. I was close. I thought it was 2002. I'm looking on Wikipedia. It says August 18, 2001. Okay. So, you were very close. So since – I'll admit, I, did, I didn't know it off the top of my head either, but I looked it up. The Cleveland Browns have been in the postseason. Well, now, they returned in 1999. Heinz Field opened in 2001. They're in the postseason once since Heinz Field has been open. 17 years. <laughs> uh, they were there in 2002. Now, they did. They had a winning season in 2007. They went 10-6, and six, but they didn't qualify for the playoffs with a 10-6 and six record. So uh, it's it's amazing to me. So that that's it. That's, that's the number right there. I mean, uh, Hugh Jackson, I don't know. Uh, you got to think that this is almost a Jeff Fisher situation where the talent might be on the field now and in that locker room, but they may need a change at the very top in order to get anything done. Now, speaking of, uh, I don't know, is inept uh, 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 the proper term for this or uh, consistent but in a bad way? I think uh, inept is a good term. Uh, bad, bad consistency. There you go. I, I'll go with that. Yeah, bad, bad. Yeah, the, the 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 you know like the perfect season with the Cleveland Browns. Except we're not talking about the Cleveland Browns. We're going to talk about well, this guy has 125 career victories. He was the 2009 NFL Coach of the Year. They won the AFC North four times under his tenure: 05, 09, 2013, 2015. Seven postseason appearances, including five straight from what now seems like it's in the distant past, 2011 to 2015. And five former assistants have gone on under his coaching tree to become NFL head coaches. This guy is the second longest tenured head coach in the NFL next to the guy that we mentioned earlier, Bill Belichick, or we alluded to at least as Tomlin being the second most successful too. So, mm -hmm. but this guy isn't the second most successful to Belichick. He's only been around next to as long as Belichick has been doing this gig. And he was about to walk out the door and baffled, puzzled, and shocked. Even Bengals fans could not believe Marvin Lewis was returning. Not only returning for 2018, extended two years. So like Hugh, He's signed through the 2019 season. I, man, I really don't know. Uh, Marvin Lewis is making some changes with some people in his staff, but they really sugarcoated this when the Bengals made this announcement. They put this out. It was January 2nd that they put out this tweet and the graphic I read these statistics from. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. That sounds pretty good. This Marvin Lewis guy must, be, must know what he's doing. Well, he's 0-7 in the postseason. And while he has 125 regular season wins, he has 112 regular season losses and three ties. He only has 10 more wins than he does losses and ties. He's barely he's barely batting 500 here. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. That's his regular season because when you put it into career, his postseason is 125 and 119. He only has six more wins than he does losses in his career. Two seasons of not making the the postseason, six nine and one and seven and nine. Buy sell, Marvin Lewis, hot seat. He might make it through twenty eighteen. I don't think he gets to twenty nineteen personally. Uh, you know, again, the, it's such a a strange uh, phenomenon with that team. It, you know the the level of lack or the lack of discipline. That you know that w you know the Steelers get criticized for having lack of discipline, but the, you know I'm sorry the poster child for lack of discipline is the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, you know th they they can turn it on and and look great during the regular season at times, and then they just fall apart. And, and, and in great great many ways, you know uh, the I guess the uh, 
focus of that tends to be Vontez Perfect, um, who, you know, lets, lets whatever gets the better of him get the better of him and, and does some bonehead things. But it's not just him. I mean, it, it's rampant throughout that team. And that falls back on the head coach. So, you know, I, I remember, you know, at the moment that, that, that Marvin Lewis, the announcement came down, Marvin Lewis was going to step away. I remember there were there were intimate intimations that he was going to go to Cleveland, um, <laughs> and you know that's just uh, what they needed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What kind of craziness was that? But you know he was going to step away, and I you know I could just imagine uh, you know the Monty Python scene, and there was much rejoicing, yay! And then of course he signs, and I I you know I have a feeling the entire city of Cincinnati. You could hear a pin drop when that came out because thinking, what the heck just happened? He was gone. <laughs> and he's back. Somehow he's back. I don't get it. Um, you know, it makes no sense to me. This is, this is, remains a, a, just incredulous. I'm incredulous that, that he managed to survive. So, you know, it's impossible for me to have a rational uh, view of whether or not He's got any hot seat to be on. You know, is it simply the Bengals are saying, well, we'll see what happens, you know, I, I, you know, and, and, you know, we'll let Marvin decide when he wants to leave because he's been here a long time. And we heard that's good. Well, it's only good if you, if you have consistent positive behavior. It's not good if you kind of don't. Um, <laughs> so, I, it's cracking, I, I don't know. It, it's cracking me up because I could picture the little cartoon meme. You've probably seen it labeled with a thousand different things on it. It's like a, a little dog cartoon or a wolf, and he's sitting in a house, and it's on fire. He's inside at the table, and it just says, this is fine. That is – put Marvin Lewis's face on that little car, uh, cartoon character there, and that's what the Bengals are. Now, he has two – this is where they have new coordinators too. Uh, Bill Lazor was the Q QB coach. And then uh, Terrell Austin takes over for Paul Gunther. Now, we'll see. Paul Gunther definitely – there was no accountability. He he was defending Vontez Perfect and things of that nature. We'll see if Terrell Austin's any different. This may breathe some new life into Marvin Lewis. But for a franchise that hasn't – they have the longest drought. The, the, the Lions uh, beat them by one season for second longest. So the Bengals have not won a postseason game since 1990, I do believe. Yeah. And I just don't know the patience there when Marvin Lewis has been around like 18 seasons or something like that. He's been around for like half of that drought and hasn't been able to do anything. Oh, seven playoff trips and nothing. And I think his window's already closed because now some of his defense is starting to get into their 30s. And the, the wheels might start uh, slowly grinding to a halt. He has some things that may or may not pan out. I mean, you still got to bet on William Jackson III uh, being a, a solid corner next to Drake Kirkpatrick and things of those nature. Plus, you got to fill in for Vontez Perfect. They still got to work on that offensive line, things of that nature. Is Joe Mixon uh, a capable, uh, uh, you know, workhorse running back or whatever? You know, uh, AJ Green. I mean, he had a, he had a down year. You still have Andy Dalton as your quarterback. It doesn't look too bright for me. Now, here's something I wanted to, to point out too. I mentioned the coaching tree. They were bragging. Five guys became head coaches. Well, who are those guys? Number one. One of them was Hugh Jackson, <laughs> so I wouldn't be bragging about that necessarily. Um, Leslie Frazier, Frazier, who spent a few years with the Minnesota Vikings. Jay Gruden, the Washington Redskins' current head coach. Mike Zimmer, who's with the Vikings. And Vance Joseph, who became the head coach of the Denver Broncos last season, all coached under as assistants to Marvin Lewis. Now, what do those guys have in common? They have all have... Like I, I, you could take uh, Mike Zimmer out for one second because of what happened in January, but before the Minnesota miracle, where Case Keenum got that p pass to Stephon Diggs, and he and he was like, you know, there was like a phantom there that didn't tackle him, and he walked in and, and they won that game. He's the only. That's the only win any of these five guys have in the postseason. I, I, so Marvin Lewis can't even like he, he's just teaching losing. Uh, to all of these other guys, too. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how much longer that he, he gets to have a job. He's made enough money, and he's had his moments in the NFL. I think the guy could retire, and, you know, I don't know if I'd put him on TV or if he'd be interested in that. But I could see him doing, like, a Bill Cowher thing, just 
very far less successful. Yeah, I, I it just stymies me. I was actually a couple weeks ago. I was in Ohio for my nephew's uh, graduation, and I got a moment to speak to the nephew I have uh, intimated about uh, previously, who's a Bengals fan. Um, and I said, you know, hey, I gave you a shout out on our podcast, told everybody that, you know, that there's something wrong with you because you love Andy Dalton. <laughs> and, and, and he he looked at me and he went, yeah, I don't know, not so much anymore. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And, and he said, you know, he and my brother, who, as, as we've discussed, was dropped on his head as a child and is also a Bengals fan. Um, as a result, you know, both of them feel bad for A.J. Green because you want to talk about squandering talent. A.J. Green is, is a... a, a a solid Hall of Fame potential, uh, you know, wide receiver mm -hmm. who has had no success in the postseason in his career. None. Because the Bengals have simply failed miserably in the postseason. Now, you can claim it's because of the quarterback, because nobody thought Andy Dalton was a top-tier quarterback except, you know, briefly the Bengals did, um, you know. And but yeah, again, it's the consistency level here has been that they find ways to lose as opposed to finding ways to win. You know, you just go back to the playoff game where there's absolutely no reason in the world the Steelers should have walked off with a victory. You know, Ben's hurt. They they got the ball up. Vontez Burfick runs off the field with an interception and doesn't get penalized so that they don't. You know, they had everything going their way. And they lost. <laughs> and, you know, it, whether you want to call it a curse, whatnot, they, they just can't get their own heads out of wherever they are to focus well enough to win. And that's a coaching issue. And, and I, I am just, if Marvin Lewis, you know, if they have the kind of season that I actually anticipate them having, which is a very poor one, and Marvin Lewis is still the head coach after this season, uh, then, then the truth is he has some kind of blackmail material on the owner, and, and he'll <laughs> never be fired. <laughs> and, I mean, it's just incredible that we're looking at the AFC North, and you got a fire Tomlin crowd that does exist out there. And then you look across and look at the other teams, and you got Hugh Jackson, who's absolutely miserable, and Marvin Lewis, who's also miserable. And you, you're really trying to decide if he, each one of them has the. They're both definitely got to be on the hot seat. There's no doubt about it. And, and again, Marvin Lewis. Hugh Jackson, two years left on their contract. Guess who else? Guess who else only has two years left? I'm guessing. I'm John, guessing John Harbaugh. John Harbaugh, the man over in the, with the Baltimore Ravens who have missed the playoffs for three straight seasons. You know, John Harbaugh was on fire when he started as a coach, okay? He got he got Joe Flacco, speaking of elite quarterbacks, and <laughs> put him elite. in with Dalton. Put him in with Dalton and Tyrod Taylor, why won't you? Um 2008, John Harbaugh takes over after Brian Billick is unceremoniously fired for going 5-11. and Now, Brian Billick, you know, he's responsible for winning their first Super Bowl with Baltimore in 2000. Uh, they made the playoffs here. They, let's see, Super Bowl, and then playoffs, then out, then playoffs, then 9-7 and seven, but missed, 6-10 and 10, missed, 13-3. and three. Uh, they, they won the AFC North in 2006. A year later, he goes 5-11 and 11 and is out the door. And the reason I'm mentioning this is, is because it didn't seem like there was a whole there was patience there when you know he missed the playoffs nine and seven then they went six and ten that's not good then he turns around and they're thirteen and three then all of a sudden they're five and eleven and they're, and they're terrible and it, well that's because they had Kyle Bowler as their quarterback and you know <laughs> although he had some success anyway but um so Harbaugh comes in and they go to the playoffs five straight years the last year. Of that five-year streak was the one where they won the Super Bowl and Ray Lewis had retired, and et cetera. And they went to the AFC Championship uh, in three of those. Obviously, they only won the one because we beat them uh, in one of those. And then um, – uh, or we beat them in the playoffs several times. Or the response, well, I'm seeing here, and it's like lost conference, lost divisional. Lost. I'm like, ah, they lost to the Steelers. Uh, but, uh, you know – coincidentally, the last time that they were actually in the postseason was 2014 when they beat us, the Ben Tate thing I was talking about. So since then, they've gone 5-11, and 8-8, eight and eight, and then they were 9-7 and seven last year. They miss uh, their window at the postseason because they keep getting beat by the Bengals at the end of the year. So the biggest advocate for John Harbaugh has got to be Ozzie Newsome. And guess what he's doing? He's heading into retirement. Their general manager is out, out of there, baby. The new guy's coming in. 
And if they don't write this ship, if they don't make the playoffs, Harbaugh could be in trouble. But even worse, imagine a scenario where the Cleveland Browns and or the Cincinnati Bengals have a better season than the Baltimore Ravens do this year. Brian, John Harbaugh, you buy him being on the hot seat? I do. I do. I, I, I'm going to give the one caveat. I, I agree. I, I think if they have a bad season again, he's, he's clearly on the hot seat. But there is a caveat to me for this. And that particular caveat has to do um, with Mr. Elite Joe Flacco. And the reason is because I'm not sure who was the one responsible, although I'm going to place this on Ozzy Newsom, for giving Flacco the contract that they gave him after the Super Bowl victory that essentially ruined their team. That contract destroyed any ability that the Ravens had to, you know, A, keep players that they needed to keep, to find players in free agency that could fill gaps. And as a result, they have been, you know, floundering, looking for offensive weapons that they simply couldn't find because they didn't draft on the offense. They drafted on the defense. And it, it's come back to haunt them dramatically ever since that that contract was signed so i don't know if that's a john harbaugh issue or not but i will say this in the same circumstance i think mike tomlin doesn't lose all you know end up with a five and eleven season uh i think that they find a way to win so you know it's it's very likely to me that john harbaugh could be on the hot seat if the ravens have another year if if the um the Louisville quarterback, who I can't – Lamar whatever, Jackson. Lamar Jackson, yeah. If the Louisville quarterback if, – if he doesn't, you know, appear to be, in fact, the next quarterback for the Baltimore Ravens, he's going to be regardless. Um, you know, if that doesn't work out, if that experiment doesn't work out and it takes them too long to transform the offense into an offense that Lamar Jackson can run and, they, and it doesn't work, if they don't have the kind of set, success that Houston had – um, you know, with with that same type of quarterback, yeah, I think it's I think it's it's really hard to not think that three out of the four quarterbacks in the or, or coaches in the AFC North might not be on the hot seat next year. They they might definitely be, and we could have a whole new landscape in 2019. Yeah, because I mean, all these guys two years left on their contract, they they may ride out. These organizations may ride out one more season. I don't know about two more seasons, and you take a look at what you're really going to lose here. If you, I don't even know that they that if Harbaugh, if they have a bad year, and let's say Flacco's healthy, so you don't force Lamar Jackson out there. I don't know he gets a chance to reboot a, a, an embarrassing season. Let's say they even finish third, or they finish one win ahead of. Let's say they're like six and ten, and the Browns are five and eleven. I don't know that he gets a chance to to start this whole thing over again with Lamar Jackson. They send Joe Flacco packing. I don't I don't know because you got like I said a new defensive coordinator. If part of that is because the defense isn't any good, well, I mean you've only had that guy around a year. Who cares? And if the offense obviously isn't any good, which they've struggled in recent years as well, uh, what do you owe Marty? You don't owe any of these guys, Marty Morningweg or any of them. The only one you really might owe is Harbaugh since he brought a Super Bowl trophy. But the reason I mentioned Brian Billick at the beginning of this is because they had a trigger finger on him pretty fast. I mean, he turned it around. Uh, Harbaugh may be the guy out of the three that lasts the longest. He may get to see 2019, but I don't know that he sees an extension in 2019 unless they're into the 2019 season and they have like a Kansas City Chiefs start the last year, like a 5-0, and a 4-1, a 4-2, a and or something where it looks like it's very promising. Maybe they lost like one of those games close. I don't know. It it was like it was a surprising thing for me because when you read the t- or you see the topic and headline for this show, and there's going to be an article out on this uh, in the near future too, where I put some of these numbers into it. I did. I didn't really go into it thinking that John Harbaugh could be on the hot seat, but the longer I think about it, there's a different GM there. We talk about how all this stuff is tied to quarterbacks, and you know, I think Andy Dalton can survive. Marvin Lewis getting fired. But I don't know that Joe Flacco survives John Harbaugh or vice versa. And Lamar Jackson in that mix, they might just they might reboot the whole thing. And what would prevent the Browns from doing that? Oh, they they actually do sit Baker Mayfield half a season or a full season. 
start over with a new guy. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I, I don't know. It, it's it's very intriguing to me because of Harbaugh's postseason record, but this is the what-have-you-done-for-me-lately type league. And three years missing the postseason. He had a winning record last year, 9-7. and seven. But, you know, I, if Cincinnati or, or Cleveland passes them by, I think that the uh, – the ownership there, maybe the front office, they, they have to, re- they may be reconsidering this whole thing. So, very interesting observations today. Yeah, I, I, I just want to say that there, it certainly struck me when they drafted Lamar Jackson that that might have been a, an impetus to say, we're not drafting him for your future, Mr. Harbaugh. We got other plans if, if you can't show us that you can do what we need to do. Because I don't know that that's his game, uh, you know that 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 he's well suited to coach a quarterback or an offense or a situation like that, the one that they'd have to have, um, because they're going to have to refocus their drafting priorities to the offense, which means the defense is going to start to slide. There's no way to keep both things in place. I mean, we've seen that in Pittsburgh. You see that in other places as well. You know, you build up one side and you hope it holds up while you try and build up the other side. Um, but you know they're they're in decline on both sides of the ball, so they're going to need to focus on on where they just spent their you know uh, their you know money, which is going to be on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, it very it's very interesting to think about. And a few years ago, you would have you know you could you th- always throw Cleveland under the bus and say yeah the the coach is always in trouble there. Um, we've thought Marvin Lewis was in trouble in Cincinnati for years. Um, and, and has escaped, but you, you didn't really think of John Harbaugh in those, in those terms. But I, I think it's a very realistic, uh, you know, view to say 2019 uh, of the four who's still left Mike Tomlin. Absolutely. And you know, one other little bonus point here, they're going to crank the, the temperature is going to get turned up because most of the teams in the AFC North face each other very early. In fact, on the Steelers schedule, they have six divisional games and five of those six are all going to be played in their first eight. They play six division games of their first eight, which goes through week nine since they have a week seven bye. They play the Browns week one, Ravens week four, uh, the Bengals in week six, and then come back around in weeks eight and nine to play the Browns and Ravens uh, for their second time of the season. Then, of course, finish and wrap the season with the Cincinnati Bengals. So it'll be kind of interesting because then if they're getting smacked around by uh, within their own division and kind of cannibalizing themselves, you know, the Steelers can get a – they could jump out to a big lead early by taking care of business in the first half of the, this 2018 season. And if they do that, it, I mean, it very much, you might see all of these teams just start getting gutted or they're going to make those preparations. Uh, I don't know. It's it, it's surprising to me at, at the very least. Not surprising that Harbaugh is still there. He was dealt a bad hand last year and did get it to get them the 9-7. and seven. But Hugh Jackson and Marvin Lewis, no way, man. I mean, it's just, <laughs> you know, continuing. What is that? The uh, the very definition of uh, insanity is repeating yeah. something and expecting the same result. If they don't get off that path, they change some coordinators. That's what the Steelers did because they feel that their problems are in other areas, but not at Mike Tomlin. I think these other guys, they need somebody else uh, at the head of this ship. So, Brian, we're up against it. Good to have you as always. Always, always an enjoyable conversation. It is. And folks, uh, most of you usually stop at this point. Hear me out for one last second. Let us know if you want to hear us talk about some of these other things or there is something you want us to talk about. We'll throw it there in the hopper. Hopefully it's enough for a whole episode or we can do like a potpourri or a mailbag. I know Brian loves the potpourri. I love the potpourri. We love the potpourri. Okay, until next time, (laughs) be safe, be good. We'll catch you later. We would like to thank you for listening and remind our listeners to follow us on social media and our website, www.steelcityunderground.com. 